Okay. Um, it's preparing. So yeah, you'll just go on the uh, Dow page under live and we'll be there. It's still downloading. There we go. Redirecting to YouTube and you should see us. I'm gonna go ahead. There we go. We're gonna record. All right. All right, show activity. Okay, fantastic. Welcome back everybody. You know who I am, Caroline Best of the Dow of Horsemanship. I am your host and I have a lovely co-host for today, Emily Feely. Say hi, Emily. Hi guys. Yeah, yay. Emily subbing for Lydia um, <clears throat> for today. And you guys have seen Emily before, whether she's been in, you know, in the comments area or helping out with web classes and things like that. So welcome back, Emily. She's one of my students. Yeah. And um, so real quick today, this is a, a really very powerful podcast, most specifically because it's about starting developing young horses, young horse development in age appropriate training. Um, at the end of this podcast, Emily and I are going to talk about her newest addition at her farm. Yeah. And, yes. Yeah. Mr. He Coco. Is Mr. Coco. So you just adopted him real quick. You just adopted him from a local rescue. He was wild. Um, he's seven years old. He was a wild Mustang. What I'm thinking of his bloodlines. He has he, what bloodline in him? The, the sulfur, Kiger. Kiger. The sulfur. Um, sulfur. Well, uh, not the, the sulfur Kiger. herd. Yeah. That comes out of That's Utah right. in Texas. Okay, cool. Yeah, so we're going to talk a little bit about him because he's in a very interesting story and he's seven <clears throat> and he's been passed around from trainer to trainer and he is a mess. Yes, yes. I'm excited is, to um, put everybody in on yeah. him at the end. Yeah, of the big class. mess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so stay tuned. We're going to talk yes. about it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Um. Yeah, great. And then you can you know, give everyone <clears throat> the Facebook page where you're going to be chronic, uh, chronic doing a journaling or, you know, video of his yes. progress. Yeah. And so we'll be he, setting up the true connection horse farm and training, uh, YouTube page. That's the name of our farm. And yeah. so we'll be pushing that out at some point. So everybody can go follow along there and we'll be working with you. So it'll be pretty cool to watch his journey. Yeah, that'll that's going to be great. And uh, he just came last Friday. I was there yeah. waiting for you guys. So yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're very excited. All right. Yeah, I am too. I it's it's always exciting and and absolutely beautiful to be able to help. Hi Becky, hi Mete. Hi ladies to help um horses period. And uh he's this is just exciting. So I'm, I'm excited and honored to be a part of the journey. All right, you guys. So let's get back to today's hot topic. So I did two podcasts about starting young horses, part one and part two, my gosh, back in 2020, literally this time, three years ago, I think it was in March, three years ago. And you can find those two episodes either on Buzzsprout or any other directory, specifically Apple Podcasts. It's a pretty um, big one and most common. So if you go to Apple and type in everything horses and more, I'll come up and then you can find Starting Young Horses Part 1 and Starting Young Horses Part 2. <clears throat> so I wanted to circle back and talk more about this because it just... There's so much to talk about. And I, you know, get emails. I was telling Emily before we went live, most of my emails are either about traumatized riding horses or starting young horses. Either the young horse has come to them with challenges from previous handling and, and bad experiences, or they they don't want to mess it up. And so it's a really hot topic. <clears throat> So I'm going to dive in deeper um, and try and simplify some complex areas. 
uh, and give you a, a more clear idea about, I think age appropriate is a key word here, um, age appropriate education or training. When do you do what and, and why and for how long? Um, so <clears throat> I'm gonna begin with, I cannot emphasize enough about keeping the curiosity in your young horse. So curiosity means confidence. The opposite of curiosity is fear, it's plain and simple. So just, I'm coming from a, a my mindset as a professional and assessing, evaluating horses before I work with them. You know, this is it. It's like, there's, we start right there with any horse and, and baby horses, like any baby, mammal, human, puppy, kitten, you name it, we're all mammals they are born curious until the curiosity gets taken away from them through a bad or negative experience. And so learning is kind of like the balance of love and leadership, working with, with uh, horses or developing or raising children or raising horses or restarting horses. There's always this balance of love and leadership. And, and it, it's so flexible and adaptable it, at any time. I mean, you're always with unconditional love, but where's that leadership and how much of it needs to come into play at what, what times. And so it's no different with balancing curiosity, allowing it, nurturing it, but also at the same time, let's say curiosity is love. And then you being a leader coming in saying, okay, I need to put some boundaries on this, or I need to shape this a little bit or redirect it or guide that curiosity or just allow it and understand that at this age, this is how it needs to be. And as the horse matures into the work that we're going to talk about, um, into its education, it will naturally, you know, it'll always be curious, but that, that level of curiosity that makes that youngster got to check everything out and spend a long time, you know, dwelling on that, that curiosity that, you know, obviously it goes away because the horse, like any maturing, you know, highly social, social and intelligent mammal, it just goes away naturally. So we're going to talk about how long does it last normally? And, and, you know, at what ages do you start doing what with the horse? Um, so curiosity means confidence, plain and simple. And we, we all have been around horses or have horses. We know what it's like when they're not curious right? They're petrified, they're fearful, they're anxious. Um, I think the biggest aha I want to drive with curiosity is recognizing curiosity. And unfortunately, unfortunately, in most of our horses, it's been knocked out of them. They're not allowed to be curious. And so, you know, and I say knocked out of them, you know, we just, we manhandle them, we get on their case, we we, you know, we don't allow it and the horse eventually shuts down and goes into some level of learned helplessness uh, because it doesn't know how else to function with, without being controlled by us, you know, managed by us. And so <clears throat> curiosity, literally, you know, the, the best way I can help people understand how it shows up in a young horse, if you're not used to seeing it or you don't understand it because believe me I get all these emails and these comments and questions on my YouTube channel or Facebook my platforms it's like well how do I know when too much is too much or I've been told that it's disrespectful or I've been told that you know my horse is being disobedient because it 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 won't focus on me and it it drags me to such and such or it constantly wants to get into everything so the best examples to help with measuring this is do you have children? Do you have, do you, have you ever raised a puppy? How about even a little kitten? So we'll just start there because developing young horses is no different than developing children. And to some, and, and it's that complicated. Okay. It's more complicated than raising a puppy because literally by the age of two, puppies kind of grow up and kittens are the same way by the age of two, all of a sudden, all that crazy kitten, you know, running around and, and what do we call it with dogs? I used to call it the happy dog dance, but they're zoom, the zoomies, <laughs> the zoomies. And they're zooming. <laughs> and yeah, kitten zoom too. So that really, it like dies when stops, when they hit two, not a young horse. And those zoomies and that happy horse can last well into adulthood. 
um, after the age of 10. And, and that is a beautiful thing to preserve and nurture. You just have to know how to guide it. Um, again, what's age appropriate. And so if you've had children or dogs, especially, um, you know, my question to you is what was it like raising the puppy? You know, did you have a healthy level of discipline, you know, boundaries um, with a lot of positive reward and conditioning in a, in a healthy way? And same for your kids, you know, use your, your inside voice inside your outside voice outside, meaning you don't scream in a restaurant, you don't, you want to teach your kids not to, you know, scream and, and rough house at the dinner table, you know, there's certain things that are appropriate. And so just to set the mindset right now, you're going to think the same way about horses, you're just if you've had kids and you and you feel confident about the way you've raised your children, same with dogs, then horses, it's going to be no different, you guys. Um, especially comparing it to children. <clears throat> so the opposite is true. If you've got, you know, dogs that run all over you and have no manners and, and are not disciplined and, you know, just run all over you, it's going to be a lot harder for you to develop a young horse, especially the size and the amount of energy that a young horse has compared to a small young dog, or even a lab, even a hundred to 150 pound dog. You know, now we're talking about, you know, three, 500, 700, 800, 1, 1200 pound horse. So, um, so just keep that in perspective and it's not a criticism. It's not a judgment. It's an understanding. So a lot of people want to raise these young horses. And when I got back into horses, I was living on the, um, Eastern shore, living in on the Eastern shore of Maryland. So I was 45 minutes from Assateague Island in Chincoteague Island. And I, you know, very familiar with the, the pony roundups and the chinkatig ponies and the, the wild feral chinkatig ponies. And so when I got back into horses, um, not only was I working with as many local rescues as possible to learn as much as I could and to, to help, I also started, my name got around and I started acquiring a lot of wild, I'll say feral chinkatig ponies that people had bought at roundup as babies, as weanlings, because they're always thinning out the herd every year. That's what the July roundup is for. And they didn't realize that they just kept these, these ponies in their backyard, like dogs. And they put them in a shed for a shelter or an old chicken coop, lots of chicken, um, chicken farms in Maryland. Oh you guys gosh. aren't familiar with Purdue chicken. Um, so long story short, you know, I get the call that here's this two, three, four year old Chincoteague stallion, or even Philly mare. And um, had was just rogue. Like now, it's coming after their kids. It's running them down. It's it's got no manners, of course. It's jumping on top of them um, like a dog. And so I would um, rescue these horses. I would take them and then I'd rehabilitate them and give them the foundation and then connect them with a student of mine because I don't sell horses. I usually only would not usually I would only sell to students of mine. So you guys kind of get an idea of where I'm headed with all of this. So if you're, if a new baby is, is new to you versus having an older horse your whole life, you've got to think like this. Um, and so this is where we're, what we're going to focus on today in this particular podcast. And of course, Emily is here. If there's any questions, just uh, let Em know, or just write it down in the comments. So uh, getting back to curiosity means confidence, plain and simple. And the lack of it means fear, and which means they're going to have issues learning and becoming confident. And again, this is absolute stuff. If your horse has fear, it is not a confident learner. And one of the biggest problems with horse training in general is you're not being taught this specific topic, meaning if your horse has issues, challenges, trauma, fear, they are not open to learning. They are not confident learners. And if you don't have a confident learner, you cannot teach. And the problem with most horse training is it becomes very mechanical because either one, the professional trainers don't understand this, or two, it's basically, I hate to say it guys, smoke and mirrors, let me get you in the door for a quick fix. Even if it's mechanical and we create this operant conditioning, positive and negative pressure and release, um, 
conditioning to your horse, you think it's fixing it because eventually the horse is going to give and it's going to do it mechanically, but you haven't fixed the problem. You haven't fixed the cause, um, the root of the problem. And so it's a quick fix. And you just have to come into it going, wow, my horse has problems. Um, I have problems with my horse because my horse has problems. Um, bottom root causes, they have fear. Okay. Just fear. And anytime we have fear, horses have fear, we're defensive and we cannot learn. So we've got to understand horse is your baby curious or your horse curious or, or are they, um, and that means they're open to learning and exploring and experiencing, or, or are they shut down and closed and reserved? So this brings us to the next big topic, thresholds. So this is understanding a horse's threshold or your baby horse. And a lot of us get these young horses as weanlings or yearlings or two-year-olds. They've already had experiences, you guys. The minute we take them away from their mother, we damage them. I did a podcast years ago on the science behind um, the stress that young weanlings, when they get weaned, the stress that they go through. And the, I think it was Tufts University, one of the major universities did this research and 98% of weanlings have ulcers because they are so stressed out being taken away from their mothers at such a young age. And when you understand, you know, naturally how horses are in the wild and raise their young, you know, they're allowed, the young are allowed to suckle um, for up to two years. So they get all of their social grooming and bonds and all of the nutrients and immune system. I mean, everything they need it is right there. And they need that two years to get everything that they need to learn how to socialize, to learn how to form deep bonds and relationships and feel safe and secure. They get all the proper nutrients from the mother. And so here we are taking these babies at five, six months old, and they're not getting what they need. And we throw them by themselves or in with an older horse. That's a bad role model. And it starts right there. And so we already know that 98% of these young weanlings have ulcers. They are stressed. So there you go. We want to um, raise so, two years old. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Exactly. And so, you know, your job when you get these babies, because it's really hard to change the equine industry's mindset about this. Oh my God, because it's all about making money. Nobody wants to keep these youngsters around that are going to cost them money. So you just have to keep in mind that if your baby comes to you, your weanling or your young, you know, older young horse comes to you and they don't have curiosity, where do you start? You start with bonding and you start with creating that relationship and giving them what they're missing, what they're lacking, what they need. So getting back to the threshold, um, so again, recognizing thresholds is critical to any horse's learning and confidence, period. Um, this is the number one area that gets overlooked, misinformed, misunderstood, and why most of our adult horses have issues. We are not taught to pay attention, respect, honor, understand, recognize our horse's thresholds. And so a threshold is emotional, mental, and physical. Examples are anything that pushes you out of your comfort is a threshold. And that can be a mental thought. It can be an emotional feeling, and it can be a geographical or physical experience. So I like to use an obvious one. How many people can, you know, are comfortable speaking in front of other people, large audiences, Let's use that as a really easy example. So that's a mental, emotional, and physical threshold. You know, you're out in front of a lot of people in a big room. Um, that's the physical threshold. The mental is your own self-criticism, confidence, or lack of. And then what it triggers emotionally, your self-esteem, lack of confidence, criticism, you name it. And so horses are no different. If you revere the horse like we do as sentient beings that have complex emotions, they are equivalent to us. Um, science keeps developing and supporting everything I've been teaching for the last 15 plus years, including that an adult horse at the age of 10 um, has the mindset and emotions of 
you know, a 10 year old human, maybe seven to 10 years old, a young kid. Um, so anyway, you've got to understand thresholds and, and that's just paying attention. Does my horse have curiosity or not? <clears throat> So if you have a young horse that's been improperly started and handled and has negative experiences, um, and they also learn from each other, remember, you could, you could go buy a two-year-old, you know, uh, not wild or feral, but untouched horse, meaning they've been out, and they have a couple of them here in Florida, and I've dealt with this too, where, oh yeah, it's a big breeding farm, whether it's thoroughbred or gated horses, there's a big gated Pasifino farm. I had quite a few clients down here for a while in Ocala. Um, it was just really hard. You know, it was a lot of older ladies, older than me by 10, 15, 20 years, getting sold these gated horses because of their back issues. And they had run these horses into the ground. So they were extremely submissive and frozen and shut down. And they didn't realize it until they started getting love. And then there, and then the horse comes out of its shell and ends up hurting. Um, and so it was a big community down here. And the point I'm making is this one Pasifino farm that was selling all of these horses to this, this older audience of women and men, they also had a breeding farm. And so on 40 acres, there were these untouched two-year-olds, three-year-olds, like they'd be dragged in for shots and trims and that was, and then fed, and it was crazy. I mean, they were practically, they were wild, you guys. And so that experience isn't healthy either. You know, and a lot of people are, oh, I'm going to get this fresh, young, untainted horse that's been out, you know, and on a, you know, a hundred acres with, with 20 other young horses. And, uh, and it has, it does not have a positive experience because it's lived in that environment. And that environment has been, you know, look at it. You know, it's it, the other horses are fearful. You know, the, these young babies are used need to be raised by positive um, role models. You know, so that they have positive experiences. So if the mother or the other herd members are afraid of people, then that's what the baby's going to learn through association to be afraid of people. It's that pure and simple. And so again, you know, can you go into a herd of horses? I don't care what age, and are they relaxed around you? Are they curious? Do they come up to you and want to touch you and connect with you? It, that's wow. If you got that, it's everything else is going to be pretty good, okay? Because right there, the horse does not fear humans. It is still curious um, and definitely wants to connect with you. So that's a plus. Something else to think about. <clears throat> So um, let's get, I wrote down a couple of core principles here. And Em, how are we doing? Any questions? Good. No questions. Good? Everybody's saying hi. And uh, okay. uh, Chris Siemens did say, thank you for sharing this information. So she's excited about. Oh, podcast. you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay. Sorry, I'm eating. <laughs> Becky, what am I eating? <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, hold on. My favorite candy. Pez, <laughs> my little sugar boost and instead of coffee. Um, first four core principles to developing horses, training horses, or retraining horses. So this is any age. Four, got to have relationship. That's first thing. Relationship before training. Okay. A strong relationship creates trust. Period relationship before training. And this goes for babies too. Number two, for core principles to developing training or retraining horses, consistency. Consistency builds good habits. Consistency is what teaches and educates. There's a huge difference between doing something once or twice and making it happen through fear, through operant conditioning, pressure and release, positive and negative. And that's what most horse training is teaching still to this day, even natural horsemanship, even some methods of positive gentle horsemanship are still using this mechanical archaic approach, okay? Where there's no consistency. It is food rewards only. So the, the horse is always looking for treat reward. That's what's 
motivating them to do what you want, but it's not teaching. Teaching and educating, you have to have consistency and repetition until the mental and and muscle memory is created. And when mental and muscle memory is created, it's what second nature, it's done. You remember it, it's there. So two is consistency. Number three is repetition. Repetition creates education. Without it, your horse isn't learning. So consistency is you show up the same all the time. You ask the same all the time. You reinforce the same. You reward the same. Repetition's right behind it. So don't move on to teaching your horse, your young horse, anything new until they already know it. So many people are so quick to move on. I I think one of my biggest pet peeves is my horse is bored. There is no such thing as your horse is bored. If they are bored, one, they're either young and that's normal. They're, you know, they're, they're, their mind is everywhere. So you got to work with that until it matures and it's ready to handle more structure. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Or maybe what you're doing, um, your horse isn't interested in, and it doesn't have a, a sense of focus or discipline of the mind. It's just like why we send our kids to school, gives them structure, teaches them a level of discipline so that their mind can be guided just like a horse into discipline, into focus. And then the fourth is reward. It builds motivation to please you and make, it also makes the experience positive. So let's get back to a horse's hierarchy of needs. And this is babies too, with their horses. First hierarchy of need is feeling safe. Second hierarchy of need is feeling comfortable. Now, this is where I'm going to go against the general consensus. Third hierarchy is they need food. When those three basic needs are met, the fourth will be play or rest. Now, a lot of people, especially in natural horsemanship, say, oh, no, it's safety, comfort, play, and then food. And I'm like, sorry, guys, you idiots. Seriously, I've not met one damaged horse that I've worked with. I've not met one damaged horse that I've worked with that would play if they're basic or rest or lie down at night when no one was around, if those three basic needs were not met. It makes sense, you guys. If a horse is constantly hungry and worried about food and anxious, they sure as shit are not gonna wanna play with you. So we've gotta meet those basic needs. And then the first two get complicated meaning safety for a horse has so much to do with relationships and forming deep bonds and having a socialization um, with you or with other herd members that, that contribute to that bonding and that community. And that's where we understand how much horses want to please and work together. And so the motivation in my work and what I teach is the relationship. I know damn well my horses will do anything I ask anytime, even when it's feeding time, because it feels so good to them when they're with me. (laughs) Emily, you guys know, you know, know, (laughs) one of my students, Becky, Mete, you're, you guys have all experienced this with your own horses following my method. And so this is, is real. Yeah. One thing I just wanted to add just to sort of enforcing the hierarchy of needs that you follow, Caroline, is when we got Coco, we were told food will not motivate him. You know, yes. we can't use it. And, you know, we don't do treat training or any of that as we know. However, the first day we had him and he won't come to us right now. He's very scared, standoffish. Mm-hmm. I was bringing in his alfalfa in the wagons behind me. And I turned around, he's right behind me. And as soon as I moved, he backed up, but I was like, oh, okay. And so we've been using that to show him he can trust us and we're safe when we bring his bucket, we step back and stand, but he definitely will do anything or come to us or closer to us for his food. So I just enforcing that, that yes, it is 
they're definitely food uh, before most everything. Yes. Yeah. I mean, well, it's a basic need. Look yeah. at what they do in the wild. They travel up to 20 miles for food. Okay. And water. So that's a basic instinct for horses. <laughs> yes. And like you just said, I mean, you know, him, he, you being able to, and this is important, us, all of us being able, especially the young baby horses and their growth spurts. That's a yeah. huge problem yeah. with young horses and why so many young horses have food anxieties and aggression around food is because that they're telling you they're, they're hungry. So you can't just go by the stupid normal practices of feed them so many flakes of hay a day. And that's it, you know, or so many pounds of feed and that's it. They're used to constantly grazing and having something in their system. So you have to figure that out. And then young horses like blue, like Zor, when he came to me at four, you know, they're, they're growing, they are big horses, and they need to be fed significantly more than your average horse. And, and so for Coco, you know, who knows what happened to him when he was first introduced to training and sent away, I think at the age of two, she got him at the rescue, and he had already had training and was messed up. So, you know, we've got to work with that basic instinct, just like I did with the wild the really truly wild horse that came to me, little Lando, that's still here a couple of years ago. It'll be what, three years? I think three years, two or three years. I think three years. I can't remember, but you know, I had to work with that basic need and make that basic need of food that actually became kind of hierarchy number one and make sure that when I gave him the food that I presented safety and comfort. And I did because the round pen was in the middle of my training field, that's where it is. And all my horses were allowed to help create that feeling of safety community because yep. they do feel safe in numbers by instinct. So I worked all those things together and yeah, and that's just beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, so we have the four core principles to my understanding, experience and method working with horses. And now we're going to talk about young horse development. There's four core principles too. They're very similar. Well, one is, okay, so this is important, guys. So relationships, number one, relationship before training. So really work on that bond. And like Coco won't, does not want to be touched, does not come to you. Um, so we know, we know for a fact that horses, the hot, you know, the highest form of bonding, which is number one for horses, having that emotional connection is number one for them. That's their sense of security, not just the herd, you know, being in large numbers that that's true too, but emotionally it's having that connection and that bonding, but touch and grooming is what helps to create and nurture bonds. So if you guys have horses or baby that doesn't want to be touched like my little blue. when he came to me at eight months old, he had no socialization by his mother. She was very unhealthy, very messed up. So she didn't teach him any socialization with the other mares or babies. She wouldn't let him go near them. She'd run them off yet. She wouldn't groom him or bond with him. Now she did allow him to suckle, but she was a nervous, anxious, stressed out horse that was constantly pacing. And so she didn't crib, but Blue was cribbing to compensate for that level of release, anxiety, and he needed a release. He learned to crib. He might've learned from another horse there too. So he came to me cribbing full of ulcers, you know, um, he still had worms, which a lot of babies will have worms. You got to really keep on top of that. And he was food aggressive. He was underweight. So really bad. So you, and he didn't know how to groom, you know, didn't know how to eat with other horses without like going nuts over his food. He kicked lovey in the forehead and, you know, had to have that flap stitched up. Um, so while Smokey was still alive, he spent six months with Smokey primarily before, you know, smoke had to be put to rest. And that was really good for helping blue learn a different way as a youngster. So relationship is key. And it's also grooming. You've got to get in there and, and be able, you both of you, you and your horse need to start grooming each other, you know, grooming other horses. That is so key to babies. And so if you have a young horse um, and it's just you, what if you, you've got them and you brought them to your farm and you don't have another horse or you have older horses or you brought them to your boarding facility, 
um, and you might not be out with anybody or it might not be safe to put them out with anybody. You, you just have to know what they need and they need a lot of relationship. And part of that is a big part of that is grooming and not just you grooming them. It's you finding all their special spots there that they like to be touched and, and scratched and then they will start grooming you. And then this becomes mouthy um, and that's okay. You know, that's another big uh Oh, a, a podcast we could do on <laughs> mouthy horses. So, yeah. you know, babies, you know, are mouthy because usually they're teething and they'll shed their teeth up until the age of five. They'll get a whole new um, set of teeth every year up until the age of five or six, maybe their fifth year is their last one. So they will teeth, they will grab on things. They will suck on things. This is not cribbing. This is not sucking wind. But, um, but you'll notice everything goes in the mouth. And that's also part of curiosity. So you don't want to dissuade a young horse, especially geldings, because it's a characteristic or a trait of male horses. They're very mouthy. Um, they'll play hard. It's all part of uh, definitely a pecking order that horses go through at a young age to establish hierarchy. And so you won't see it in mares as much, um, but you'll definitely see it in boy horses. And you don't want to discourage that. And so that's where you have to learn how to redirect that um, or give them something to do, like my work that teaches them how to get quiet and focused and just literally a, a level of meditation for them. And, and that'll that's age appropriate, though. That's where it, it'll it'll be really intense the first two years, like puppies chewing on everything. Um, so you so, you know, this is a whole nother podcast. I'm not going to dive in deep about mouthy. For young horses, just know that it's it's it should be allowed. It's part of the way that they learn their environment and they experience their environment, including you. And so if I've got a really mouthy young horse, I'll often I'm all over their face all the time anyway, kissing them and blowing in their their mouth. Um, they love when I blow up their cheeks with air, you know, because it's playful, blowing in their nose. Um, and, you know, and, and I'll play with them and they'll play back and I'll allow them to lick and, and nibble. It's all good. You just don't want them biting you or, or, you know, learning that they can really bite you. Um, but biting's part of it. So that's a whole nother, like I said, a whole nother podcast. You just have to know what's age appropriate and how to not wean them off of it, but how to keep doing the work, developing them and just allowing it, but maybe redirecting it at the same time. So it's like, I always let them chew on the lead ropes, chew on the whip, if they're not destroying the rubber on the whip, you know, you don't want them to chew on, learn to chew on everything. Don't get me wrong. You gotta learn like it's wax on wax off. Like, okay, I want to allow you to, to pick up the bucket and bite on everything, but now we're going to go somewhere else. You know, you, you've had some time exploring your environment and, but I don't want you destroying your environment. And then you don't want to criticize them by hitting them or hey, 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 or anything really sharp that's going to scare them. You know, just redirect it, ask them to back up. Hey, we're going to go over here now. I'm going to send you around me, give you something to do. We'll focus, maybe go graze. So relationship is number one for young horse development. Number two is experience. And in this order. So exposure does not mean desensitizing. So giving your horse lots of experiences does not equal desensitizing at all. There is no desensitizing in my method. You're going to you're going to mess it up you guys, especially the way it's taught. I mean, learning how to properly sensitize or desensitize a horse is quite a skill. And desensitizing should only be used in extreme cases of rehabilitation and very briefly. So it should not even, you know, you shouldn't have to do it. If your horse has plenty of confidence, they're not going to be scared of anything. And if they really trust you, they're not going to be scared of anything you present. And so my young horse blue had quite a few strikes against him and he's five. And this is the year that I'm going to slowly introduce him into his um, intense education for the lack of a better, but it's not that intense, but it's, He's had nothing. He's had some education that's been age appropriate. And then I've left him alone because he gets handled the same way every day by me. So he has that consistency. He has that relationship. He has that 
that repetition and that beautiful reward in the relationship. Um, so only, you know, when I knew that he needed me to work with him, did I work with him and then I would leave him alone. And so blue has the fear of bags, the fear of tarps. If you all know blue and you've seen him on the YouTube channel. And so you've seen him when he was eight months, we took a two and a half hour video on the YouTube channel and broke it down, I think into three parts. And he was dripping wet at the end. I mean, he acted like a wild horse. I've never worked with a baby on such a strong self-preservation mode like him and not to mention his athleticism. Um, he was crazy, but he also learned this. Um, it wasn't, he wasn't born with this fear. So you want experience. It means exposure. Can you hand walk your baby all over the property, all over the facility and allow them to, are they curious? If they're curious, allow it. Okay. If we spend enough time here, maybe they'll start grazing and that tells you they're ready to do something else. Or maybe you say, okay, we're going to walk over here now. But it's also part of how you walk. So you can do a little bit of development and training while you're, ex you know, giving them that exposure and that experience. And all of that can be learned in my big mastery um, membership writing foundation program. It's for young babies, too. Just because you're not riding, there is so much to do before you ride to begin with. Number three is threshold. Learn how to recognize them and respect them. Don't push a young horse through. Let them tell you how they feel. It's information. And then you'll learn, wow, man, we've been stuck here. Sometimes with a young horse, you'll be stuck there for a year or two. Blue was stuck um, with the bag and the tarp. And I did what I could to in those videos to get him safe enough for my staff to handle. Because that's why I created that video years ago. Because he basically ran one of my staff members down. Uh, it was hard. I mean, it's horrible uh, because a bag flew out on a windy day and, and it was horrible. But other than that, it's taken him to this age, four years later, and bags are always around and tarps are always around to, to just get enough courage. If you look at some of those most recent videos of this year, just to get enough courage and confidence to try to work around a tarp. In that, and I don't force it. And you'll see Lovey, who used to be petrified at tarps at Liberty, go up and help him. She now paws at the tarp, picks it up, stands on it, rests on it. That horse wouldn't go near them. So he was also learning to fear tarps from Sundance and Lovey here. So I know that this is the way it should be done. I know, meaning you guys are probably going, what the heck? I can't wait all these years. Then go ahead and force it and see what it does. You have see to. what you create. Yeah, see what you, you create. To then you're gonna have to fight. Yeah. Resistance. We don't want to yep. work with resistance. When you see resistance, why make it happen? We are taught to push. And I think it's instinctual in predators and in the human mind, the ego, but we're taught to push. We do it in all of our relationships. Why can't we just back off, respect that other being, whether it's your human relationship or your horse, that they're not ready. So there's so much work you can be doing to help them. Like I've done with blue plus blue is young. Had he been a 10 year old that came to me afraid of tarps, we would have been able to work through that in no time, you guys, but their brains aren't ready. That's why it's age appropriate. There's stages to developing young horses and, um, and everybody's a little unique, you know, everybody matures a little differently, but we can stereotype it a little bit. Um, the third, I said, is thresholds, and the fourth is slow. This is this probably could be number one, but I think I think it's number one, the number one reason why so many people their young horses are messed up is because the training has been rushed, pushed. It's too fast. The young horse hasn't even had time to be a young horse, and I just can't emphasize that enough. To me, you really shouldn't even begin any intense training until the age of seven, you know, blue's going to start to go into a more formal education. I won't use the word intense. When I say intense at the age of seven, we know that all their bones have, um, uh, all their bones, like their back, their spine, they have matured and fully formed. 
we know by the age of seven, science has proven that. So why would I want to be riding, let alone bouncing if I'm not a good rider on my horse's back from the ages of two to seven? Why would I want to do that? So and, Chris has yeah. um, kind of a question slash comment. She said, my three-year-old plays with tarp. So that's fantastic. But she's awesome. concerned about his pushiness. I asked her to clarify mm-hmm. that. Is he pushy with her? And she said he mm-hmm. is. So I don't know if okay. you want to talk about mm-hmm. a little bit how to handle that. So did she say he, is it a boy? Yes, he. Okay. Um, so you have, to, <clears throat> this is where I go back to like puppies and young kids and young horses. And you have to teach them what's appropriate. That's why you say age appropriate. So I don't know what age you got your three-year-old. He might've come to you at the age of two or two and a half or three, pushy. You just have to teach him. Um, But also there's that love and leadership, that balancing of understanding and respecting that he's three and he's a boy and boys are pushy and some are more dominant, the more dominant a personality, not, he's not necessarily dominant by pushing you because pushing can mean many things, you guys, just like biting can mean many things, but I'm just going to generalize it right now because we can, and then we can always dive in deeper with a coaching session where I can review video or we can talk about it because I cannot fully assess a situation unless I'm there or I can lay my eyes on it. But it's natural for boys. Mares can do it too. They're just more dominant in personality. So there is, see horses instinctively young babies when they're playing and you won't see it with mares, but you'll see it with geldings. That is a pecking order. And pecking order is what it it sounds like. They're pecking to see where they fit into the hierarchy. Once they figure that hierarchy out, it's done. They settle, especially wild horses. They all accept their positions and they all know how to work together. So there's never one lead horse. There might be a lead horse in a specific situation because they have more experience and confidence. But if they're not experienced or confident, another horse will come up and lead. So just understanding some of this basic dogma out there that has taught us that horses need alpha people. They need, you need to tell them who's boss. You know, that's disrespectful. if They're pushing on you. You got to allow some of it. You got to allow, that's him trying to figure out where he belongs. And then you say, that's enough. It's no different than your child or your puppy. Like they're going to want to jump on you, your puppy, until you, you teach them, no, that I will give you the attention you're looking for, but you need to ask me a certain way, puppy. And jumping is not how you get my attention or jumping is not how you're going to show me how much you love me or care. You, you see that the puppy wants to jump. They jump because they want attention or they care about you. So why not give them the attention and teach them that when you sit, maybe put your paw on me or whine, teach them. So for the horse, it's no different because it's just, it's part of their socialization, pushing. It's part of figuring out where they belong. It's part of figuring out you. And so for me, I, you know, I want to teach all my young horses, even as weanlings, to respect my space, just like they would in a natural herd dynamic. Um, You know, they'll know early on very quickly who they can go up to in that herd dynamic and who they need to respect. And so, you know, for me, it's like, I know how babies will progress. I know the stages and it's like, okay, you know, I'm going to assess you. Are you a little bit more dominant or a little bit more introverted, you know, if you're more dominant, I'm already going to assert myself early on with you, young horse, meaning before you even think about running into my space, I'm going to set up the opportunity to watch you play and run. And when you do the zoomies and think of coming towards me, I'm just going to take my big lunge whip and just stand still. And here's my space. And they might even gently just run right into that whip, but they're already going, Whoa, there was a flick of the tail. (laughs) There was a flick of mom saying, oh, nope, that's too close. So, so gently and assertively, but lovingly, you can set it up where you become like mama's tail or pin of the ear. Nope. And you put that energy out there and that intention. You do your zoomies out there. You do your zoomies around me, but you keep 10 feet from me. And so if you've got a horse that's three and he's already, maybe he's learned this. I don't know his experience with you. 
Um, and we don't have a podcast to dedicate all that detail. She so did that's where eight her, months old. Okay, you got him at eight months old. So yeah, so it's so hard because nobody's educating people like this podcast about young horses and and what is a what's a what's normal for them instinctively and in, in a healthy natural herd dynamic. You know what happens? How are they raised? And I'm doing the best I can by saying, you know, look at healthy young children. You know, look at healthy young dogs that have manners, that that are happy and curious. They're not shut down, but they know how to talk to you. They know how to connect and communicate and get their needs met without having extreme behaviors. And so we really want to meet the needs of our young horses. We have to, or we don't provide their first hierarchy of need, that, that sense of security, that sense of safety. You know, they need to feel safe with us. They need to feel that we love them and we're going to, you know, but we're also going to provide structure and, and um, some level of discipline. So uh, yeah, the first thing I would do with your three-year-old, if you haven't already, is start teaching them how to back away from you, back away from you and respect your space and stand patiently. That would be the first. And I teach this in my big mastery membership, relationship ground and riding foundation program. And then it would be sending and leading and how to get your horse to lead behind you until, you know, they're ready to lead next to you. Um, so we have relationship experience thresholds and going slow. Wow. We've really taken that going slow and staying longer out of it completely. Everybody wants to ride and it's absolutely makes me sick. Because when you look at the science of it, how much damage you do, I wish I was taught this when I got my three-year-old Sundance and my turning five Smokey um, and Legend was already damaged. His He could have been born with weak suspensory in the hind end. Um, but when dad got him at eight and I didn't start working with him until 11, he was 11. Um, and then one to two years into um, and legend was my top horse doing, you know, three tempi, uh, bridalist lead changes, hot call, you know, the works that I realized watching video, how bad those suspensory were getting. So he got basically semi-retired in his early teens. He could still do performances. He already knew everything. I didn't need to exercise the hell out of this horse anymore at all. Okay. You guys get that. So, um, if I, I wish I had known what I know today, because I, I believe I destroyed both Sundance and Smokey, um, their longevity and soundness. Absolutely. Now I've been told differently with Smokey's uh, acute arthritis in his left front leg that basically put him down, you know, that that was something he could have inherited as a trait for the quarter horse. And it was made worse with the brace in his body. Um, in Sundance, you look at her, she's all crippled up with arthritis at the age of 21. And, um, and I know that's again, because she had so much, both of them had trauma before I got them. They were both rescues, rehab, but they had so much tension and brace um, through their minds and their bodies. And I was searching and searching, um, you know, I don't want to start crying. I owe them so much respect for pushing me down this, this road to figuring out what I'm teaching today. It's just unnecessary. There's so much we can do to enjoy our horses. We can put our first ride on at the age of two, you know, we can do all of that, but it's just this intense riding, um, that is destroying our horses, let alone the minds, you know, just because I put rides on a two and three-year-old doesn't mean I'm going to put them into formal education because they're just not ready. You know, this is where it's age appropriate. It's no different than putting your, your five-year-old who's supposed to be going into kindergarten just because they're brilliant and they're a servant. They're, why would you put them socially into third grade? They're not ready. So that's huge. Um, a lot of questions. How do you know when to move forward with your young horse? You're not going to know. That's why you need to be educated. And again, you know, I, I built this massive, comprehensive, one-of-a-kind, universal, step-by-step -step program. 
my mastery program because it is for every type of horse in every situation. Just because you're not ready to ride doesn't mean you can't do all these other amazing things with your young horse or your older horse that's been traumatized and you're restarting them through the program. Um, so moving forward, you've got to learn that you guys, there's, there's, I, that's another big myth buster and dogma out there is there's so many professionals just teaching you, you know, simple things, but they don't know what's the big picture of where you are with your horse per se, you know, you're out there buying this information, thinking, oh, in this one CD or this one 12 week course or two week course or eight week course, I'm going to know everything I need to know, you know, to help me. It's not that easy. You know, there's, it's like, my gosh, I'm a therapist for horses. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it's, it's that complicated. And working with thousands of horses has given me, you know, the, the experience to be able to, to not just diagnose and, and problem solve, but understand how some things can get generalized. And then there's a lot of specifics to other things. Um, so it's no different to me than a lot of our human psychology and behavior. So how do you know when to move forward? That's a tough one, but I will help you the best I can. So here's my answer to that. It is a tough one, but mostly you know when to move forward in any horse's development or training at any age, when your horse is calm, relaxed with the experience, and they understand what you're asking them. Meaning if I'm giving you the cue to back up and you're backing up, and you look calm and attentive and focused on me, wow, that's A plus, we got it. Let's move on to the next thing. Doesn't mean we stop asking for the backup. We're gonna keep doing it age appropriate for as long as needed until we don't have to do it anymore. So you have to understand the purpose of every exercise. Why would I wanna keep doing the backup with a young horse, meaning for years? because I know a young horse is fractious and easily distracted. And if I don't keep reinforcing, that's where repetition comes in, reinforcing the backup, the horse is gonna forget about me and possibly run me over. And we want to really keep asking our horse to focus on us, stay connected, be mindful of us. That's why that backup may stay for years. It just will be easier and easier until the horse is like, yep, every time I'm in my, my person's company, I know I need to be mindful because I could hurt them. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And, and yeah. I know we're talking about the young horse, but I can't help but how this relates to any horse with trauma and mm -hmm. a, my third Trigger. one, the triggers, what they were put through, a Donye had no confidence. He was low man on the totem pole. Um, mm -hmm. All these things when I got him and through the work, through taking the time, letting him develop um, and not, you know, pushing over pushing him or asking too much. He is now confident. He, he plays, he grooms. Um, he actually was trying to use his teeth, on me, his teeth on me the other day. And we had to have a conversation about how mom's skin is not as tough as his or his sister's. <laughs> <laughs> But just through the process and allowing him um, the time and the support and, and learning myself to become that leader and love for him, he has come so far. Um, yeah. And I just can't, yeah, it just makes complete sense, whether it's a young horse or a traumatized older horse, giving them the time and support that they need and not mm -hmm. overdoing it because of what we want and what our ambitions exactly. are. Exactly making it happen. I think, I think too, it's just a lack of education. I, I want to say we're just not informed this way. You know, once, once it's there, it's there for life. And what, what's the big picture in all of this, whether it's a young horse or older horse, we want, we want to have that level of con connection. We want to both be present, us and our horses. We want to be mindful of each other. We want to feel safe in each other's presence. You know, we want all of those wonderful things to happen. So you want to keep doing these types of exercises that I teach, like the backup, 
until you feel that those things, the big picture is accomplished. And it's much easier with an older horse, even with trauma, because the brain is the cognitive abilities are already there. Younger horses, just like young kids, they just take a while until they catch up. It's just like telling, you can only hope when you're telling your young kid, like my son, my stepson, you know, that after so many years, it's finally going to click, right? I don't have to tell them anymore. I mean, that, I think every parent, we've all, we're all there. And so you just know as a parent, it gets frustrating. You get exhausted. When is it going to be the day that I can stop reminding my, my child to do X, Y, and Z or do it this way or talk this way or speak this way or, or push your chair in or sit up at the table, you know, whatever it is, finally, it'll click if you do it right. If you do it where they're going to hate it, then you know what that result's going to be. And for horses, unfortunately, because they're so passive by nature, they're pleasers by nature. They want to get along. They want to please us. Um, They're easy to control, believe it or not. I know this sounds counterintuitive, you guys, but look at all the harsh mechanical ways of training we've been doing all these years to make our horses comply, to make them submit when we don't have to do it that way. Give them the benefit of being intelligent. Understand how much they really want to be with us and partner with us. You just have to learn how to go about it the right way. So you don't ruin them and have all these backlashes, all these issues. Um, Okay. Wow. I can't believe an hour has gone by. Um, (laughs) So understand like young children, young horses get bored and easily distracted. This is normal and needs to be respected. So don't confuse bored with needing something new to learn. So here we go back to education and, and a young horse's inability to take on too much. Okay. So many people write into me, my horse acts bored. And my first thing is how old are they? Well, they're seven or they're, they're nine. So they're starting to peak into maturity at the age of nine and 10 for sure. And I'm like, okay, well, what do they know? You know, do you have X, Y, and Z in place? Because to me, I want to create a Zen with my horses. I'm going to create the zone through meditation, focus, and discipline. And that's what all my students learn with me. And so that means that we can we can sit quietly together. We can be quiet together in everything we do, with any kind of work, riding. We know how to be in that moment, whether you've been triggered or you or just have a lack of focus and discipline, we know how to be together in that moment. It takes a, it's a practice. It's a practice. Um, wild horses. It is not, this is, this is where we've damaged our domesticated horses. You get a wild horse and man with no triggers, they are in the moment better than anything. So there's a lot to be learned there. Um, yeah, that's another hard thing. Not very many of us have that experience. So again, I see so many confused horse owners thinking they need to keep their young horse busy or to desensitize them so they aren't scared. Um, both will damage your young horse's confidence though. And, and well, not both will damage their confidence, the desensitizing will. But if you're constantly allowing your horse to, you know, basically drag you to whatever they're interested in, you know, then, you know, there's an extreme. We don't want extremes here. We want to allow curiosity, but then redirect it. There's that, that yin and yang, that wax on, wax off, that balance of, yes, I, I see that you really want to go explore that and maybe play with it. Okay, now it's time to go back to do something more focused with me and connected with me. Um, eventually, when they mature, they'll always be in that moment with you. The curiosity won't really be there. It might be, oh, what is this? Oh, oh, okay, wow. You know, versus a baby, you'll spend an hour with it and destroy it. <laughs> we don't want to teach them to destroy it. <laughs> um, okay, so understanding how horses learn. Let's go through these bullet points real quick. Horses are sentient beings who have complex feelings and opinions. They are socially intelligent, craving deep bonds and family. These deep bonds and relationships are what make them feel safe, secure, and their needs are met. Man, this is critical. 
Number two, horses are passive species, born followers who instinctively seek harmonious relationships and want to get along. You got to figure out how to find that in your dynamic with your horse, how to find that harmony, that flow, and how to work together. Three, to accept leadership from you, the horse must trust you first and respect you. You must earn that. You must earn it. And so if your horse is disrespectful, and I say it in quotes, um, they're not. You've got to teach them how to respect what you say, your space, that no means no, that I want you to work with me now. You've got to teach them that. If leadership is forced, they will submit. It's self-preservation though. But they will never accept you or choose you. And trust me, they will leave you in a heartbeat and you will get hurt. So <laughs> yeah, they will work. They will work, but with some level of fear, anxiety, or learned helplessness. So we have to recognize all of that. Four, when a horse feels safe and secure, they're calm and relaxed. This means they're in their parasympathetic nervous system and are open to learning. So I put in bold, this is the only time you should train a horse, period, when they're in their parasympathetic nervous system. Their state of rest and digest, where they are calm, open, and relaxed. And five, when a horse does not feel safe and secure, they're anxious and preoccupied. We all know what that looks like. They're not in the moment. This means they are in the past, in a memory, they're triggered, and they're in their sympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic. That means they're not open to learning. They're in self-preservation mode. So they're sympathetic and parasympathetic. You need to train only in parasympathetic, and it can switch like that. Even a young baby who has no fear, you might come on too strong and they might, their instincts will take over. They're flooded with adrenaline and off, or you might confuse them or frustrate them. And there they'll go from parasympathetic to sympathetic, just like that. And all of a sudden you've got fight, flight, or freeze on your hands. So you can, and when you're rehabilitating a horse or even learning how to train a horse, they can go back and forth between both nervous systems. You've got to be able to identify when is your horse leaving that calm rest and digest and starting to freeze up, tighten up and go into either freeze or when they're getting, you know, more, they're escalating into a fight or flight, shut it down. Shut it down. I teach all of this in my big program. Get them back into the parasympathetic and go and work from there. So two, two key points. Training should be in stages. Training should be in stages. <laughs> Whereas developing a horse is constant. And you will do both in any age. So if I have a young horse, I'm developing them with short periods of training. What, what would be short? You have to know what's age appropriate. Well, they have to learn how to be haltered. They have to learn how to pick up their feet for me. They have to learn how to be tied, but it doesn't mean I will tie them to teach them. Hell no. So there's training, right, in stages. So it's not just age appropriate stages. It's also training should be in stages at any age. And when you're developing them, it's constant because you're developing habits. Habits have to be a constant repetitious process. So is education till it becomes second nature. All right. The opposite of this has become the norm. We take a two-year-old and we begin their formal training. I can't even say formal training because they put 30 <laughs> days on that and destroy them. So they, what do they do? Oh man, I got this horse cantering and first day. Oh my God. The two-year-old isn't even mentally or physically balanced to handle a rider, let alone you jerking them all over the place. They're going to fall in, drop a shoulder. They don't have the strength or the balance or the self-carriage. And, and yet we're going to ride them for 30 days. 
There's no groundwork usually with these horses. And even at the age of two, you do not want to do any intense lunging. Their bones, tendons, joints especially are not fully um, closed. And this is, this is definitely how I believe I messed up my two young quarter horses without understanding any of this, even though I was paying lots of money and trying to learn. I didn't know the right questions to, to ask, and nobody was giving me this information freely. From dressage to reining to natural horsemanship, I couldn't get it anywhere. So here it is. How about competing a two or three-year-old? What about reining? What about dressage? Oh, my three-year-old is, uh, you know, training level dressage. What? The masters of, of classical dressage. I always talk about the Spanish school of riding, which still exists. They might, they're developing their young horses. They're doing age appropriate stages. And by the age of four, they're bringing them into some formal education. Um, these horses, all their high school upper level movements are developed way before the riders ever introduced. And the rider isn't introduced until like the age, obviously seven or eight, when their joints and backs have fully fused, not fused, but developed. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. How about jumping a three or four year old horse? Insane. Number one key principle. We are developing our young horses. Remember the mindset, language is everything. We're developing them, developing them, developing good habits, shaping them to the best of our ability. They are who they are. They have their own unique personalities. You got to understand what to work with. And that's another hard thing. So if you do have a dominant horse, like I do with Zor, you better, you better be okay with that. Zor will give you his heart. Zor is amazing at some things, but he has zero work ethic, even though he has an amazing, you know, ability to do a canter pirouette practically on his own, you know, and through, through the schooling that I've given him, but he has no motivation. So he just figure wants to that one out. All the time. Yeah, he just wants to love you. <laughs> As I say, molest you, right? Yeah. He will find that that point of tension on your back, though, and and rub it out. <laughs> so Chris made a comment yes. that thirty days doesn't have to mean damage. Uh, my the trainer she uses has used all the different horsemanship techniques. Correct. Thirty days? No, thirty days does not. Obviously not. It depends on what you're doing. I've had a lot of young horses. Great point, Chris. Thank you. A lot of young horses come to me. And I'll tell them exactly what I'm going to do. Yes, you can bring, we did the, we have a course on it. Um, it's actually my young horse course that I sell, but it's restarting. Um, it's restarting two damaged, challenged young horses, Blue and Susie. They're both two. Um, Blue's five, they're both five now. And then it was starting a five-year-old, three-year-old, three-year-old Frisian. So yeah, you can do a lot in 30 days, but it's how you do it. And, and are you, is the trainer keeping in mind the things that we're talking about, the maturity level of the horse, what's age appropriate to them mentally, emotionally, and physically? And, and what do you expect at the age of two? You absolutely, neither Blue or Susie would you get on at the age of two. No way. And that has so much to do with the damage that was done. But I think it was a, the three-year-old Frisian that was with me for just five days. I did not get on him, but I could have gotten on him. Um, so temperament has a lot to do with it. That Frisian temperament, you know, you've got blue, his parents raced thoroughbreds, you know, Susie was registered quarter horse and thoroughbred. She was double registered and both her parents raced. So, you know, bloodlines do matter. Um, yeah, there's nothing wrong. I got on a lot of my two and three year olds and gave them their first rides in a week because I either raised them or they were raised right. And here I got permission to get on and let's work on the go button, the stop button and the steering. And we we're just walking. Maybe we pick up a little bit of a trot, but you got to realize you can't develop a horse physically in 30 days. It's like an athlete. So even if, what are you doing, you know, in 30 days to any horse, I don't care what age it is, you know, it takes time to develop balance in a horse mentally and physically. And so often, you know, 
that is the reason why our horses are bucking and running around and having tantrums when we lunge them, whether it's free lunging or on the line, you know, they're not balanced and it's dangerous for them. When they lose their balance, their adrenaline kicks in, their instincts kick in. It's very scary for them. So that's my question back to you is that's, that's great, but what are you doing in 30 days? Um, you know, what's the purpose? What's the expectation? You know, what ages are the horse? What age is the horse? Um, anyway, okay. So the first key principle is we're developing our young horses, right? Developing is the key word here. Number two is training happens in stages. It doesn't matter what age in stages. And it takes a lot longer for younger horses because it has to be age appropriate or we'll ruin them mentally, emotionally, and physically. <clears throat> So let's move on. All right, let's talk about ages and stages of emotional, mental, and physical maturity in young horses. So I broke it down to weanling. We all know what weanling is from birth to, well, in wild horses, it's two years, but we wean our horses, you know, before they're one. So we're going to say weanlings from zero to one years of age, when they're born to one year. And we have our yearling, that's one, so one-year-old. Then we have our two-year-olds. And then we have our two to three years. We have three to four. Then we have four to six, could do five. We have six to seven, seven to nine, and then 10. So I've broken down these ages according to my experience and seen patterns. And this is a strong pattern that, that from a weanling to a yearling in that first year, they act a certain way, all of them, doesn't matter what sex, breed, that's a weanling, that's just the, the equine species, they act a certain way. When they're a yearling, they, they change, it's another way that they act. When they become two, they change, it's another way that they act. So these are their stages. And then between the ages of two and three, sometimes they're a slow um, uh, late bloom, late bloomer. You know, they're slow to mature. So a three-year-old might still act like a two-year-old, but they really start to mature quickly between two and three. You'll see significant changes like a mouthier two-year-old or, you know, a more um, aroused two-year-old or even curious, you know, anything that's more extreme as a two-year-old will start to mellow out as they become three. Does that make sense? So any kind of extreme trait or behavior, as long as the, tr the training isn't triggering or creating anything or the handling or the environment, as long as everything stays the same and they're allowed to just naturally mature, you'll see a significant change between two and three. And then three and four, they kind of stay the same. They're kind of the same that whole year. And then four, to five, yeah, they really start, you'll really start to see another level of maturity. Um, and, you know, normally if your horse is untainted and doesn't have any issues, oh my gosh, you know, if you start uh, putting first rides on them at two, which you should be able to do and you have permission to get on, you know, and you're slowly developing them and, and doing things slowly by the age of four, I had Smokey's nephew at the age of four he was first level dressage, but my way bitless, um, didn't, didn't have a saddle or bad riding. There was no intense riding. There was no banging on his back or banging on. He was 17, two hands at the age of four. Well, well before four at the age of two. So again, you have a big horse. You don't, you better not be banging around on them or running them around. You're going to destroy their joints. They will have no soundness as they get older. So by the time he was four, you know, he was going out in group trail rides, light fox hunting. Uh, the horse was, and I raised him from a baby, from a weanling and sold him to a student of mine. He, I mean, he looked like a 10 year old and he was a goofy, he was double registered quarter horse thoroughbred. He looked like a thoroughbred, his father. And he was flighty, goofy weanling. Like he was just, so anxious. Um, so yeah, we got to look at, you know, where they are personality wise. So six years of age, 
you know, seven, again, another level of maturity, um, kind of evening out. And then you've got seven to nine. That's when, you know, you can start really giving them a more intense education. Like, okay, now I'm going to start. Now you've got a great foundation of groundwork and light riding, and you know, some easy cues, right? Like, you know, your go button's great in all your transitions and your gates and your stop button's great and your steering's great. Um, you've got a pretty healthy at the age of seven, I've developed you slowly over time, not every day, not every week, not every month. Um, but I've developed you slowly enough so that by the age of seven, you've got self carriage, you're strong and balanced. So now I'm going to start. So that would kind of fit training level dressage. Now I'm going to start now to teach you some more advanced maneuvers, they're going to ask for more gymnastics from you. And in more strength building and balance building exercises, because it's appropriate now. I'm not going to be hurting your joints. I'm not going to be stressing your back out. I'm not going to be stressing your mind out because these young horses can only like a young child take in so much information and process it. So I know by the age of seven, for the most part, if he's been, if your horse has been raised right, or even if you're restarting the horse and you, and you know, they're younger than seven by the age of seven is a pretty good age to start you know, a more informal education. Um, let's see. So we already went over three keys to success, right? Consistency, repetition, and reward. That's my three, always. We want short periods. Um, so this is basically my approach to developing or training any horse, but developing a young horse. So you want three keys to success, consistency, repetition, reward. That's with any horse. You want short periods or intervals of, of learning, short periods of learning, um, not every day, but maybe so many days in a row with so many days off because you're looking to create patterns. So that means you don't just go one day and then come back five days later. Um, <laughs> stop on a good point and build from there. You'd be surprised, Emily, you laugh, but you'd be, I only have two days a week with my horse. And I'm like, I'll do, how old are they? Let's talk yeah. about it. Let's see what we can accomplish in two days. Let's be realistic. Um, give lots of dwell time, as I call it. So this is time to pause, let things sink in and process. And so again, we're looking for the parasympathetic nervous system. We're looking for a horse to do a lot of licking and chewing. Yawning means they've really processed what's been going on and they're super relaxed. You know, they're releasing endorphins. It doesn't get any better than that. And then building good habits is an everyday practice until the horse just knows. And you're just like where I'm at with my guys. It's, it's amazing. It's, and there's so many things when you develop this foundation that I'm talking about in my big program, you know, I can take five of my horses who can't wait to eat and come through this back alley gate and I can open that gate up and 99% of the time, you know, Zor's not there controlling it. Uh, they're all, they all will go, will check in with me first before they walk to their stalls or to their food. They will check in with me. Food is not their motivation. It's, they just, it's so many of these good habits are like, no, you're not going to run through me, run past me. Let's stay connected. You're going to get fed, but they feel safe and secure. It's not a technical or mechanical conditioned response I've created in them. I never made them or forced them to check in with me. Oh my God, I'm not Hitler would never think like that, but all the building blocks are there, meaning they feel safe. They, they enjoy my company. Um, they want a kiss on the eyeball. They want that connection from me before they go to eat. It doesn't get any better than that. They don't just stop and, and freeze. And then I say, you can go, they are coming to me for affection. And some of them will stay while the other ones might run by. It just doesn't get any better than that, you guys. And when you have that, and it takes all of these building skills, when you have that depth of relationship, you will be safe because the horse is always thinking about you and they're in their parasympathetic nervous system. So they're not in their fight, flight, or freeze. They're not in their self-preservation. And even if they're, they're getting ready to switch into that sympathetic nervous system, you have plenty of time because they're going to keep checking in 
to you for that level of leadership and security and safety that you've been giving them, even if it, even if it breaks, because something new just happened that just blew their mind and they're ready to, to, to go and blow, they're going to look at you first. They're going to check in with you first. It's so beautiful. So um, let's go through this real quick. You know you're wrong when your young horse acts like this. And this is important. You know that you're doing the wrong thing when these things happen. And this can be older horses too, because I get these questions all the time. And everybody e that emails me about this wants my opinion because they've been told that, that their horse is wrong and that their horse is disobedient, that their horse is disrespectful and that they need to do X, Y, and Z. So I'm flipping it. I'm reversing this because you're wrong. They're wrong for telling you that. And you know, you've done something wrong when your horse acts like this. They're frustrated. They kick out, they snake at you. They paw at you. They stomp at you. They're frustrated. They're pissed off. Yes. They get like that. They're angry. They're irritated. They're <clears throat> telling you something. Now, again, here comes that boundary and that balance. Like, okay, I hear you, but enough's enough. Or you can talk to me like that, but over there, not in front of me. Don't threaten me. Don't threaten me. If I haven't threatened you, don't threaten me. I'm real clear about that because I've worked with a lot of really crazy trauma cases. And they're so used to practically attacking people to, to get them to leave them alone. And I'm like, uh-uh, I didn't attack you. I'm not, hey, 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 be in the moment with me too, horse. Be in the moment. I'm not that person. And it, it changes like that. Believe me, it's powerful. So you always have that right to protect yourself. And that's why when you begin my method, um, I always ask you to carry a long lunge whip. Always. Until you don't need it anymore. For many reasons. For many, many, many reasons. It's an extension of you. If your horse re is reactive and runs away, runs off, overreacts and acts afraid of everything then you're doing something wrong. You're pushing too hard. You're blowing your horse, you're overfacing, overwhelming them, trigger stacking them, pushing them through thresholds. If your horse is nervous and skittish, apprehensive, shy and balking. So how many of you out there are like, well, my horse came this way. My horse is already this way. So my question to you is, what are you doing to change that? I'm talking about the horse you have today. I don't want to hear, well, my horse came to me like this, and it's a year later, it's six months later. What did you do to create this, nurture it, maintain it? Something needs to change. And if your horse is acting like this or any one of these, you need, you need to change your mindset first and then what you're doing. Your horse is resistant. This is usually labeled dominant lazy, stubborn, dull. Resistance means a lot of things. Resistance can be fighting you, pulling away from you, pushing through you, running away from you. Or resistance can be refusing to engage. Neither is healthy. So with young horses, it is normal like kids to test you. And one of the common dogmas out there is, and I get this from people with their adult horses that say this about my, my adult horse. Oh, they're just testing you. You better show him who's boss. What? First of all, if you're, I, most of the time, that's not even accurate. The horse is not testing you. The horse is expressing themselves and they're irritated and you don't know how to deal with it or how to understand it. And so you, and you've been taught that your horse by someone else, that they're testing you. So you better correct them. Normally, most of the time, it's just information, figure out what they're trying to tell you. But with a young horse, it's natural for them. And if your older horse has never learned healthy boundaries, and I'm not talking about a three-year-old because they're still young um, and they will test you. That is true. You know, well up until around the age of four. So testing will naturally go away well, between two and four. This just depends on their environment and who's raising them. Are you raising them? Is a healthy herd raising them? So socialization and learning what's acceptable 
in that herd of two or herd of, of horses is really key. Um, but you can change that. You can change it by teaching your horse. Okay, hey, stop pushing on me like that. Or why are you pushing on me should be the first question. And um, maybe it's just something they've learned. But normally it's, it's an expression. Everything is the horse trying to tell you something. Um, so developing good habits begins everywhere and in every interaction with your horse. So just like a young child or puppy, we are teaching them how to be in our world and interact with us all the time. So it's a conscious decision. You know, it's not just like, hey, I said, keep out of my space and you walk on. Good luck with that. You're either going to create fear and they're never going to come in your space like Coco, yep. the little wild guy you got, or it could be for many reasons. He doesn't come, doesn't want anything to do with people. It's just horrible. Or they're going to Da, 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 right back in your face again <laughs> like Luke <laughs> <laughs> and Luke is nine or ten but has never been taught that's beautifully put and Luke is a beautiful horse yeah but has never been taught here's a nine or ten nine or ten year old I think he's nine but he's nine. never been taught to pay attention to me you know I just asked you and I'm teaching you I don't like you in my space when you just barrel right into me I do like you in my space when you're soft and you're looking at me and you're engaged and we're yeah. connected, but I don't like you when you just blow right through me because you're going to end up running me over. So last but not least, I'm going to leave you guys with this question because I get this often, especially with my students. Um, I'm so afraid of messing my horse up. Well, that's why you have my program and you have me to help support and guide you. Um, but also the program teaches you how to really listen to yourself and your horse. So you have a lot of autonomy and, and independence and you learn how to trust yourself, trust your intuition and trust your horse. And so I appreciate when you say you're afraid and you don't want to mess up your horse, but if you don't try, you're never going to gain the experience that is yeah. needed to, to really understand where you need to be for your horse. And so um, I, I understand, and, it's, and I also wanna say it's good to be afraid because it makes you conscientious, right? It makes you more concerned about not screwing up your horse instead of going, I'm not afraid, you know, I'm just gonna march right in there. And, um, and, you know, and I'm serious about that because, you know, I have a lot of confidence in, overall, I have a lot of confidence. There's things I'm not confident about. Believe me, I have my insecurities like, like everybody else. But overall, I'm pretty confident. And when I got back into horses, I had, I was the opposite. I was like, I'm not afraid. I'm going to jump right into this. I can't wait to get into this. And, and, and that was a great attitude for a learner. I wasn't afraid to learn. But it also meant I wasn't afraid to make mistakes. I didn't realize that at first. Okay. Because my ego was pretty big. And so I didn't want to make any mistakes. What I didn't learn is that all of those mistakes I made were amazing opportunities of learning that developed me into the person and teacher I am today. And so it's, it's, it's that mindset again and attitude, because in the beginning, I was a lot different than I am right now. I had that confidence. I had that drive. I'm like, I'm going to go in there and get it done. But I was pushing and plowing right through. And I wasn't paying attention to my horses. And I wasn't being talked to either, trust me. But I wasn't paying attention to my horses telling me, giving me so much feedback, especially Legend. Well, just Legend was my true guide when I got back into horses because Smokey and Sundance were so damaged. And I knew I, that, I didn't know what to do, you know? So I took a lot more time and was more careful with the two of them, where with Legend, I wasn't as careful. And, and he had enough ego for a horse and personality for everyone that knew <laughs> Lele to put me in my place and knock me down, not physically, but he wore my, I always say this, only one horse that ever broke me. And that was legend. And I needed to be broken so I could rebuild. He didn't break me physically. He broke me mentally. And I needed that. You know, I, I spent a lot of time crying and a lot of frustration and, and I need, and I personally needed that. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That's all I have to say. You're not going to mess them up if your heart's in the right, right place. 
especially. And if I can add okay. to that, Caroline, really yes. quick, is yes. for anybody who doesn't know my backstory, basically I came back into horses like everybody does, wanting horse, wanting to be in horses, grew up riding, all of that. But I realized very quickly, nobody truly is teaching you how to be a horse person, woman, man, that it's, they want to do it for you, want to make it quick, easy so that you can do the things that you want to do, ride, show all of that. I got back out of horses because of that. And then I found the mastery membership and the Dow and Caroline and very quickly realized this approach is teaching you how to be a horse, woman, man, person. It's teaching you how to think, how to help your horse and how to problem solve, not just for your horse, but for yourself. So just like Caroline discussed in her experience and having to go through this personal development with her horses, this process teaches you to do that. And it really teaches you how to help your horse. So even if you experience a new challenge, you're going to be able to at least problem solve enough to make get you guys safe. And then you call Caroline crying like I've done many times and say, this just happened. What do I do? But it gives you that ability to become a good leader for yourself and your horse. Um, I, in my personal opinion, I don't think there's anything that I've seen that really does that so that you are able to learn with your horse. You're able to teach them and develop that connection and relationship that, you know, we, most people want, but don't know how to get it. Very through to riding. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, that's why I created this because it certainly wasn't around when I was searching and I still haven't found anything, you know, like my program, obviously, but it is my apprenticeship program. You know, people that, that get this, this, this was created for, for the, you know, the young women that came to me that wanted to learn how to develop their horses and didn't realize that this it is also developing themselves. And then I put it online. So anybody from you know, anywhere in the world now can access this way. I'm teaching you how to do it now. You know, you're not just learning quick fixes. You're learning this way of being the yep. Tao of horsemanship is a way of being. It's a, it's a way of taking your essence, your presence, your being into the relationship you share with your horse and all the work you're going to do together. And then of course it, it changes you too, you know, and, and it affects all of your relationships. Um, not just your four-legged. Thank yeah. you. Um, so welcome. yeah, so real quick, I had two quick questions and then we're going to talk about Coco and then we got to go. Um, quick question was from one of our mastery membership students. And um, so she has a seven-year-old with limited exposure and handling. He's so curious, not much fear in him, um, but he's also very buddy sour now too. So I think Linda, you probably got a lot. Um, you will get a lot out of this podcast. And, and of course, she has the, I'm pretty sure, Linda, you're a mastery membership student. So you have everything you need at your fingertips to help um, Fonzie learn, you know, everything he needs to learn. At, and he's seven now. So he's right there. He's ready. And then the more you develop with Fonzie, he will have autonomy, a healthy level of autonomy. He won't be um, so lost in, in buddy sour. And plus he'll, you know, you're going to make him whole. He's going to feel really good being in, in the relationship with you. So the buddy sour, you know, horses get attached, you know, I, my horses are very attached, but if I take them away, they are attached to me. If I take one of their friends away, they, they're still, they're attached to their friend, but the key is that you, that they become attached to you too. And then we had another question from one of our our followers on our social media here, Dow Horsemanship YouTube and Facebook, Victoria, um, she's been asking a question that she has a young horse that's super confident with everything um, she has shown her. And then her husband wanted this young horse to go into training. I think it's only five, this mare. And so she put the horse into 60 days of training and now She's a wreck under saddle. Mm -hmm. So, but fine on the ground. And my big, my big answer to that, and I say big, cause it's, it's not easy is if you're, if your horse is messed up under saddle, they're a mess on the ground. You just haven't figured it out yet. You don't know enough because my riding foundation program starts on the ground. 
and it builds to the writing and it and it builds in a way that you can easily backtrack. It's all inclusive, meaning everything you need to know is right there. So if by the time something goes wrong in the writing part of the program, you can always backtrack and fix it. But nine out of 10 times, there won't be anything wrong by the time you ride because you're learning the step by step process. Um, of how to develop your horse mentally, you know, holistically, mentally, emotionally, and physically, so that you get permission to get on. And you don't ride unless you have permission. So for me right now, I don't have that problem. I mean, I haven't had that problem in years, but let's say, let's say I go to get on one of my horses and they pin their ears or they don't want to come and get me. It's one of two things. One, there's something physically going on. Like they've got ulcers, lovey. And I'm talking about lovey specifically or Sundance years ago when she said, uh, uh-uh, my back is done. My arthritis is done. Then I had her, um, checked out and old in x-rayed and ultrasound to, to see the arthritis all over. Um, so they're always going to tell you what's going on if you listen. And if it's, if you're too thick headed or, ego or arrogant to listen. And I'm not picking on Victoria at all. It could be any of us. Believe me, I've been there. That was legend for me. They're going to get loud. And so your poor horse is now a wreck under saddle. You can fix all that, but it won't get fixed by riding because all you're going to do is re-traumatize. It's no different than going to therapy. A lot of the new therapy is really awesome these days because It's not the old therapy, the old traditional therapy, where you would go and talk about your problems for years on end, because every time you talk about your problem, you're actually reinitiating the trigger. You're reinitiating the memory, reinitiating the trauma, which reinitiates the trigger. It's no different than a traumatized riding horse. You think you're going to fix it by riding. You're just reinitiating the trigger and the trauma. You got to backtrack and go back to the ground and do it in a way that I've created that is going to full circle figure out how to make things at least 75% better so that when you do do get permission to get on, your horse is going to trust you, connect with you, and know that they can have a conversation with you so that when they do get triggered, it's a minimal trigger. You're both, you're paying attention and you know how to meet that need immediately. I mean, this shit's deep. So there is no one, there's no quick fix for a traumatized riding horse. You got to go back to square one and build that level of trust and connection and communication so that when the horse is unsure and it'll never be that unsure again, because you're going to get it to a place where, you know, it would go from zero to hero. It might go zero to 10, but you can have a conversation about it and you can reassure that horse. Now it's powerful. Okay, so let's talk about Coco real quick. Yes. Um, yeah. So Coco is the newest addition to our farm uh, here at uh, True Connection Horse Farm. And he is a seven year old, uh, we'll say wild, because he's been uh, he was wild. domestic. Mustang. Yeah, Mustang um, since he was two. So we had been looking for. Uh, another addition I started off wanting to really find something my husband could learn like just get confident riding on which of course in the whole approach we take doesn't mean anything it's um, always that way isn't it, it we go to look for a riding horse and end up with a, tra- a trauma case I know yes you know <laughs> uh so you know I I looked and nothing felt right and then we had our clinic and we met Coco the rescue brought him uh to m- to my farm for the clinic and he just kind of spoke to us. We saw, uh, you know, in his eyes, like he's the in there, the pain, um, the pain, you know, that he's not completely gone, that he just needs time. He's and right. so they put him yeah. up, yeah, for adoption. Uh, and I reached out and we had conversations over a couple of weeks because um, they, you know, they were trying to do uh, good by him by not just giving him to anybody because they mm-hmm. knew that would set him up for failure, that he was not a horse well, that just couple, anybody could take. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt because there's a couple of um, points that, you know, I, I'm i a myth buster. You guys know I'm a pioneer. And there, you know, there's some things 
it's like one of the things we were told about, you know, during the clinic and he was a sample horse yes. um, so that I could, I could demonstrate my method with, but I certainly wasn't there to prove anything or to make anything happen. It was really just, uh, he was one of several horses that I worked with and he, and I was able to really just dive into the, um, you know, reading the horse and understanding where he was coming from and respecting yes. his threshold yes. and working with energy. And that was really all I did with this horse, which did not impress the, uh, the rescue um, founder at all, you know, she, for whatever reason. So she was not impressed that we really made any breakthrough or I made any breakthrough with this little guy. And what can you do when he absolutely doesn't want to come to yeah. you, runs from yeah. you, yeah. Um, is, is just frozen and you go to touch him and he just, uh, you know, yeah. spooks in place. It's like you electrocute him. Um, you know, he's very obedient, but he's petrified. And a lot of it, you know, a lot of people will talk about where the horse comes from or it's bloodlines. And, and I'm not going to dispute a lot of that. There's a lot of truth to bloodlines in this, this particular bloodline. I'm no expert on Mustangs. Um, the, the founder of this rescue said that it, it is a, a harder horse, you know, the instincts are stronger, yeah, strong. the They're wild more, instinct, uh, isolated. I guess the, mm -hmm. where the herd is, they tend to be more isolated. So they don't have as much interaction with people, with humans, or, with humans and yeah. And, and it's, it's cool. Cause they do learn from each other, even though you have all these different bands of wild horses and different wild horse herds from different States and areas in the state, they, they communicate and they yeah. learn from each other. And, and that's what, you know, we're saying right now is that this particular band of Hit way that he belonged to was like Emily said, more isolated, less, you know, contact with humans, less association. Um, and, and so that self-preservation, that instinct is really strong in yep. these guys. I, I had an experience with one of the, the wild Chincoteague uh, ponies that was a stallion that I ended up rescuing at the age of four, three or four. Oh my God. And, um, and, thunder and he too had that really strong wild instinct yeah. and and he looked like um he actually had wild mustang in him because they'll do that with the chingatique ponies so they don't they thin out the the bloodlines they'll oh. bring in only three three specific breeds quarter horse mustang and arabian they only bring in those three to mix with the chingatique and he oh my god he looked like legend smaller build than lay oh with a mane and, and forelock like out to here and just beautiful and wild. Carol ended up buying him from me um, after I spent about a year and a half with him and of course yeah. got him gelded. But he, you guys, when I got him gelded, he spent six months in my round pen and, and damaged half the panels. And this was 60 foot round pen because my round pen, like all my, like this one, they're always in the middle or in my training area. And, and so I was starting to allow my herd of horses to get around him, to socialize him. And he would jump body slam and, you know, here he was 14 hands. And, and I always had the highest round pen you could buy, which is like the one I have now, Emily. Yeah. So if I'm yeah. eight, it's they're, like 10 foot, yeah, I think 10 foot high. high. Yeah. It's high. He would get to the top and, and he would just almost jump it and, and body oh slam gosh. it. He crushed half my round pen. Um, I kept having to replace panels and he crushed half of it in a, a, like a three month period because I kept working with him, yeah. trying to socialize him. And he would just go after the geldings to get to the mare. And that's, so there is truth to that. And if you don't understand the bloodlines to the best of your ability or allow the horse to tell you, I didn't know anything about this when I worked with, with thunder. I just knew that this is what I was working with. <laughs> and this was my first wild horse experience. Yeah. Of course it had to be crazy. Right. <laughs> and then I, I got two of them together. I got two little stallions together. Bandit was a little Brown and white, um, typical Chincoteague Brown and white where uh -huh. thunder was a blood. Day. And, and bandit was half the size pony size and as docile as, I mean, I had him in 30 days. Um, they, they were, maybe Thunder was four or five and Bandit, they were about the same age, four or five. Had him in about 30 days. 
where you could, you were on him, you could walk around and then he got sold to, he wasn't afraid of anything. This girl came out and he did not get sold to a student. He got sold to somebody locally who was going to use him on, in birthday parties. He wasn't afraid of anything. No exposure to to crazy stuff, but wasn't afraid of anything. So you have two completely different bloodlines and personalities. So there is truth to that, but it's a shame that we don't take the time to appreciate where the horse is. You don't even have to know the experience, but just know, man, this horse is shut down or, or cold or hostile or standoffish or, you know, learn how to read them. And then what's, you know, what's appropriate that's going to help. He was, you know, um, the background that I have on him is is he was rounded up when he was two as part of the BLM um, out of, I think, Fort Worth, Texas, but in Texas. Mm -hmm. And was adopted at that point. Um, I we don't know a lot about the person that adopted him then. My my assumption mm-hmm. would be just like anybody else that wants to adopt a wild Mustang, they're looking probably to try to show what they can do, train him, do the normal stuff. And then well, the one the one trainer, real quick, that she the founder um likes. Uh, yeah. The last trainer he was at where he did great according to her under saddle. Yeah. Or he did, the horse did great with this guy under saddle. The guy is standing on his back, sends me yeah. a picture of the Mustang in, you know, bridle and saddle, and he's standing on yeah. his back. I'm like, what? Whatever. Yeah. I hate that. He ended up at the rescue because the girl that bought him or took him out of the BLM then ended up selling or giving him to another girl who at that point supposedly he became aggressive and she became afraid of him. And one of the things, as I'm listening to the podcast today, all I can think about is how he can't, he was communicating. I don't know what happened. I don't know the details, you know, hopefully she didn't actually get hurt, but yeah. he's probably at this point, three years old, you know, somewhere in the three-year-old range. Cause he was with the rescue for four years and he's seven. So he is probably screaming with everything he has that he's being overfaced. Mm-hmm. He's unsure. He's afraid yeah. and nobody's yeah. listening to him because yes. it's about the people. And so he ends up at the rescue, which, you know, they sent him over the years. He went to different clinics. They tried different things. He did go mm-hmm. to this trainer for, I think, 60 days, 30 or 60 days, um, might've been 90 days, somewhere in there. 60. I think 60. Six, yeah, I do too. Mm-hmm. And so that is where, you know, like Caroline just said, he was written, um, the, you know, all these things because people are thinking, okay, we want to make him a riding pony. That's what people want horses for. And nobody mm-hmm. at any point truly gave him the opportunity just to be a horse, to decompress, to process everything he'd been through. Um, I will say, you know, at the rescue, they definitely loved him or or love him. They definitely, you know, did everything they could to try to help him. And, but, you know, they have a lot of horses and it's just, he's the kind of horse that is going to take time, probably years. Um, And he's seven. He's he's, still so young. Yeah. he's, He's still young so young and the the founder and I had a lot of conversations and I just reiterated with her over and over I don't care about riding him I don't care if I ever ride him I don't care if he is just a pasture pet because we get that's where we get and he's happy and he's content and he's just wants to be loved on that's fine um but we I really had to go over that with her because most people and this is the problem with the with the equine industry they want to they want to be able to ride. They want to be able to prove, look at me, look what I got him to do. And so now we've had him since Friday, um, which was such an emotional roller coaster for us. And, you know, bringing a, bringing a horse into my family, um, I'm going to probably cry is not something I take lightly. <laughs> um, my Adani and my Amora are my hearts, uh, in, in, you know, doing that's not something we, we did lightly. And he truly has a forever home here. Like no matter what, he's not going anywhere. Like we will figure this out and we'll give him the time. But since Friday, 
um, his, we made a little area for him because if he went in the big pasture, we would never catch him. So we made him an, a beautiful little area. Um, we had friends come and help us, which was fantastic. And so he's in there and he's next to Luke and Maple, which are the two horses that are boarding with us and are, re- you know, I've been helping restart um, in the math, in the Dow of horsemanship. And he immediately wanted to connect with them. He immediately was concerned about them. And over, it's not even been a week, he has him and Luke, who's the, um, the gelding in there, have, and Luke was the one we were kind of joking about that his just goofy outgoing um but him and Luke have become friends and he looks for Luke and yeah. we've watched him even though like he doesn't want me to touch him um he will like if I put the bucket down or the hay and step back he'll come over um he will stand in front of us and eat you know so things were there's curiosity there's desire that he's not so far gone we see that and we're honoring that for him but we've watched him relax. We've watched him being in an environment where there's not um, a lot of different horses that he's trying to balance their energies and whatever traumas and whatever there's they no have. There's, there's no, no stress. stress. Um, no. We're not forcing our, would I love to touch him right now? Oh my God. Yeah. I'm dying to groom him. I'm dying to kiss his little adorable face, but <laughs> I'm not going to force it on him because then he will never come to me. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of people don't believe he can get any better than what he is now. And I don't, which breaks my heart. That makes me want, that just brings tears to my eyes because he's not happy. He's shut down. He's scared. He's insecure because yes, he has the natural instincts, but he's also pairing that with the trauma from people. And he hasn't been Mm -hmm. given the opportunity to process all that. And um, he's looking and chewing, you know, being in this environment, uh, he, I've watched him lick and chew. He's, you see him try There's to do a lot of imbalances. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and he, just like people, he has a lot of imbalances. He, you know, she said he can't socialize. Yep. He can't connect with people. He doesn't know where to be with horses. Yeah. And so much yeah. of that will, will fix itself when, yeah. when he can feel more balanced and he, exactly. and so part of what you're, and you're trying to say, and that's what you've learned in the method and what you're able to give him is an environment that's going to support that unwinding process for him, yeah. an environment that's going to support the rebuilding process for him. And so much of, of what he needs in any horse like him that has trauma is they need to feel safe in their environment. And, and, and if, and, you know, we talked about safety already you know, safety is an emotional thing, but it's an environmental thing. It's a social thing. Yeah. And so if, if he has constant trauma and stress, and a lot of people have this in their boarding facilities and yeah. you, before you guys bought your farm, you know, you experience this stress, yeah. your horses, it would, it would affect your horses, you know, being in stressful environments. It's just the nature of horses and their nervous systems connecting. Yeah. So this giving him a chance has to start a real chance has to start in the right environment. Yes. And, and that's what he has with you guys. And, and that's what I always provide when horses come here is that they've got the right environment with socialized horses who are waiting, you know, waiting to, to be, to be whatever they need to be for this, for the horse. So that's a great place to start. And then you guys are also supporting that personally in the way you handle him and yeah. giving him the space and time to just decompress and naturally let his guard down. And then, you know, where, whenever that time is, and I'm going to be there helping you, you yeah. know, learn where, when that timing is appropriate to, to take it to the next stage, like, okay, you've had X amount of time to decompress. We start seeing, you know, good behaviors, good good ways of being together, not behaviors, but just good ways of being together. It, he needs that consistency to feel safe too. He needs to know that you guys are going to show up the same way every day, not expect anything or push him right now. And and when he can trust that, and that's what we're going to also talk about in film. And as we chron, I keep saying like chronicle, like do like, you know, journal him. Yeah. Then you know, we'll we'll know because it'll be more obvious when he's ready to say, "Hey, I'm ready," either to engage or I'm stuck. You know, yeah. either either one. Either he's going to say, "I'm ready to engage," or you know, it's three months now and and we haven't 
gotten any farther. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and either, needs- either way, that's the time to say, okay, it's time to take it to the next. Yeah. Maybe we just need to push him out of that comfort um, and it is a threshold yep. until we can make that breakthrough, which is often with triggered traumatized horses, make that breakthrough where he goes, oh my God, oh my God, it's too hard to try, but wow, you know, you led me down that rabbit hole and wow, I had no idea it could be this good. Yep. And that's not an overnight yep. sensation. It no. never is. It, no. it, it's the layers and, and he's got to get to that point where, you know, he has to make that positive association. Um, we do our job, but it's got to click for him too. And that's where you just don't know how long it's going to take. And that's the beauty is he's not being, he's not, he's not either being forced into a 30 or 60 day fix it program. He's not being put with, you know, anyone with the, with an ego that's like, oh, I get to work with this. I'll change it. You know, I'll change this wild horse and you're not getting paid for it. So there's no pressure. You know what I mean? It's your horse now. So there's no pressure on you or you know you know what i'm saying yeah like he's these just kids have it bad when yeah. they have that kind of pressure like they're trying yep. to turn these horses right and get them yeah. out and they've only got so much money to invest in it in a trainer so it is it's hard yeah it's hard. And it they is. were really you know i i said to caroline and pe- other friends that he really was meant to come here because no part of this, once we made, once we made the decision felt, I didn't normally, like, I, I tend to second guess, you know, if any, when we bring new animals in, cause I always worry about the dynamics and, you know, I love the dynamics we have here and we don't feel that way with him at all. And, you know, the last, however many days it's been, we've watched just the environment change him. You know, he does these cute shaking trying to release that are really tight mm-hmm. it's just kind of yes. cute to watch because you can see it almost you think he would be saying, I want to let go but I'm not sure I'm not ready but I'm gonna try and he's yawning uh he is he was standing that is huge it is he's standing along the fence line um you know he's completely dropped com- just relaxed he's doing his little shakes he's trying to yawn and it's just his head is low, low. it his is beautiful soft and I can see that I can see, you know, when I first approach, he'll look at me and I come in just like I will to, you know, feed him and you just can kind of watch and he'll get curious and he'll check out. He's playing peekaboo around the side of the run in this morning, <laughs> but I can see when he shifts and when he starts to think yeah. and gets out of the sympathetic and into it. And we're just honoring that, you know, and yeah. giving him the chance to yes figure it out to and, do what he, yeah to let him do what he needs to do yeah absolutely see how yeah. much of it can just naturally happen through the right environment and the right approach the right approach which has nothing to do with training has nothing to do with training right now and, and that's um, the part that cool. is the heart was hard the hardest to try to convey is that this yeah is very different <laughs> and to just give us the chance like let you know it went right over the head though, yeah. because that's what I was doing during the symposium with him was here's an approach. There's no, I'm not going to make significant changes, but yeah. if you know what you're looking for, which most people don't, you'll yeah. see all the subtleties and the shifts in him when he's given the right approach. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's cool. So cool. Yeah. I can't, so I, yeah. We're exciting. excited to share, you know, and obviously Caroline's going to be there to mentor me and help me. And, and Coco is going to challenge us in, in different ways than my two horses do now. And I'm excited for that. And even now, my poor husband who wants to coddle and love everything, you know, he's <laughs> like, babe, I feel so bad. Like he just wants to be with his friends or, you know, I just want, and I'm like, do not. And he's not going, <laughs> to, but like, we've had to have those conversations because he's, you know, he's not like, him loose. <laughs> you know, I was like, we'll never catch him and so it's challenging us in other ways too no and it's not even the catching part it's it's you don't want him in a big environment where he can make the choice to avoid you yeah you don't so this is where you're you're creating the environment you're you're first of all you're just you're you're creating you've already have a wonderful environment for him to be in but you're taking his little pen which isn't that little because he was living in a small round pen 
he actually has a, you know, a run in shelter and he had a little bit of grass, but he's eaten that probably, but you've, you've confined him enough so that he has room, plenty of room, but yep. he can't, he can't avoid you. Yeah. You he don't want stand, that. You, know, you don't want him out yeah. in a big pasture where he can purposely avoid you because you're not going to make any progress. Yeah. And you, you know, this is where it's kind of, you know, space where like when I go mm -hmm. in, he can watch me. And if he wants to stand back, he can, like, we can respect okay. his needs, but like you're saying, Caroline, he can't, I'm not trying to catch him in a four acre pasture that would never no. happen. And then we're not able yeah. to give him the opportunity to get to know us yep. because right now his instinctual and, and all of that is so strong and in, in the fear. Cause that's what I see when I see him as a horse, who's just scared. He's just scared. Mm -hmm. Um, but he will come for alfalfa. He will come up to us and not, you know, if you move, he'll, he'll back up, but he will come very close. Well, remember what I told you when, when Lando came to me, you know, to accelerate this, you can, I would not feed him unless you, you know, you're allowing it, but he's not, he wasn't, he's not wild like Lando was yeah. when he came to me. So you could, you could accelerate this, like I said, by just, here's the mounting block. I'm coming in, yeah. sitting on the mounting block, and here's a bucket of alfalfa, and it's right between my legs. If you really yeah. want the alfalfa, yeah. you're going to, I won't touch you. I won't touch you. Yeah. I won't try to hand feed you, but it is right here. So you have to get right here or right, right in front of me. I mean, or, or maybe five feet, and then it's three feet, and then it's yeah. right in front of me. You could, you know, create that environment where you're forcing him to get closer to you, but you're giving him choice. He's, yeah. He can leave. He can decide how long he wants to stay. He has plenty of choice, but yeah. you're still creating that environment to, to expediate this a little bit. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. And that's kind of my plan. I just, with it being, it feels like he's been here longer because it just feels right and good. And it seems to be feeling the same for him. That's kind of my plan. And I just, right now, this first week, maybe two weeks or however long giving, not pushing him so much that he doesn't want to that I over you know I overface them too much right away um oh, but okay. yeah so I'm excited <laughs> oh you're okay yeah, I am too. yeah. you know I, my water pressure you know in the guest house here whenever someone's filling up the yeah the only water it's not automatic and it's can you hear that I can't, but I, I know what this is. Something's going on with the water pressure, but nobody's here but me. So I don't know, we're good to go. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, what the heck? All right. Well, we better wrap it up, love. Yes. Um, so thank you. Really excited. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for, for co-hosting. And yes, um, I can't wait to um, let everybody know that where they can see, they can see the the journey of Coco on your Facebook page for your farm, right? Yeah. So we, the, our farm is True Connection Horse Farm and Training. Um, we are a student and apprentice of the Dow Horsemanship. So that's in working with Caroline. Um, I just want that to be very clear. We're not <laughs> creating our own training program here. We're doing um, in partnership, but we haven't quite figured the right word, but helping other people with that but yes yeah, so we have a facebook page we just launched um we have instagram uh and then we'll be start setting up our youtube channel so we'll be posting yeah. on that um sharing yeah. hosting events clinics you know just really cr helping create a community and being a satellite um for the dow horsemanship and awesome. whatnot. But yeah everybody Yay. can go check us out there and follow and <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope this podcast was good for everybody. And you guys know where to find me if you need any assistance with anything. And everybody, God bless. And may you always be one with horses. Thank you. And love you. Mwah. Thanks, hon. Okay, bye, everybody. See you next week. Oh, real quick. Next week, we have uh, guest speaker, Dr. Rob Silver. And we are going to be doing healing your pets with integrative medicine. So that's next week. All right. Interesting. Okay. All right, everybody have a great rest of your week. And thank you. Bye, hon. Catch up with you. Bye. Thanks.